Um, hello and welcome to this Maritime London webinar in partnership with Maritime London members, Jumar Technologies and Consirus. I'm Josh Dandewitt, Chief Executive of Maritime London, and I'll be moderating today's session exploring how marine insurance has conducted business during the pandemic uh, and what that means for the future of the market. Um, in many ways, marine insurance has been remarkably resilient through the pa pandemic. The pragmatism and ingenuity shown to ensure marine insurers can continue to serve the needs of the, uh, of the global shipping community from homes instead of offices has been a great success. Uh, and of course, we have seen the acceleration in the use of emergent, emergent insure tech in KYC underwriting and claims processes. However, I think, um, I think it's fair to say that this success has raised a number of questions for a market that is founded in, uh, in trust and face-to-face and -face interaction for both the medium and, and the long term. So uh, in that context, we have an excellent panel today to discuss these changes uh, and what those changes may mean for the market. Uh, to kick us off, we have two presentations two presentations from providers of InsureTech solutions uh, in the form of Nick Roscoe, uh, Chief Operating Officer at Consirus, uh, and then followed by Adrian Sutherland, uh, Chief Technology Officer at Jumar Technology. And then Nick and Adrian uh, will be joined for uh, an interactive discussion uh, by uh, Ole Jorgen uh, Eikanger, uh, Chief Business Development Officer at the Norwegian Club, uh, James Cooper, Group Managing Director of Astara, and Jun Lin, Vice President at Guard UK. Right, before we get cracking, uh, I'll run through some housekeeping. Of course, we don't expect any tech issues, but if we do have any problems, please do bear with us. Uh, we'll do our best to minimise background noise, but I apologise in advance for any uh, pet, children, telephone related interruptions. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available to attendees both through this platform uh, and it will be posted on the Maritime London YouTube channel. Uh, we have a one-to-one -one networking session uh, for an hour directly after this webinar. So uh, when it's closed, if you have time, do move through to the networking area uh, and you know make some new contacts or perhaps catch up with some old friends. Uh, and please do uh, visit the sponsor of the webinars, Consirius's booth in the expo area. Importantly, you'll see on the uh, right hand side of your screen a Q&A box. Uh, do feel free to ask questions uh, and I'll do, as I'll, I'll do my best to answer as many questions as I can uh, during, the, uh, during the discussion which will follow the presentations. Uh, and lastly, if at any stage you are virtually lost, so to speak, uh, just click on the area with a red label which is where the action is taking place. Uh, and of course, if things get really serious, please do put the issue in the chat. Uh, and one of our team members will do their very best to. Good. Uh, and uh, Olga, what I'll do is I'll, if I, if that's OK, I'll share the slides on my end and then you can uh, fiddle with the video technology if that helps. an excellent idea adrian cool okay well uh i'm doing it the old way and hope fingers crossed the uh, presentation gods will smile on me so my name is adrian sutherland i'm the uh, cto of juma technology so i think it's fair to say in this talk i will be arguing for technology but uh i do understand that there's a, a human factor as well um just very quickly, uh, I really do need to uh, introduce my employer. So Juma Technology, I think this slide, I won't, I'm not going to go through it point by point, but the point is Juma Technology, you know, we're a long established um, SME providing technology services for, for marine insurance and the marine industry as, as well as some other industries as well. Um, and we are application 
people. So in the terms of application development, consultancy on how to better use and develop applications, we do obviously delivery and development ourselves and governance around complex programs and integration, and we can manage legacy and new application systems. So, you know, if you're interested in applications, do please talk to us. And I think part of our point of view is the data services, Nick, uh, will agree with me that I'm sure that you know data is the, the key to, the key to everything and then finally last of the introduction slides um, you know we work very closely with the PNI club ship owners PNI club but really I think the point is um, you know our clients uh, say nice things about us and uh, we work really really hard to make sure that we deliver business success to our clients and, and that's really kind of our purpose. I put this slide together uh, in January before the pandemic, so 18, about 18 months ago. It, it wasn't highlighted then, but what I was doing is, you know, with a kind of bit of a strategy hat on, I was writing down all the pressures I saw in the marine insurance industry and, and what Juma was doing to respond to those pressures. And when I revisited this slide yesterday in, in preparation for this session, I highlighted the ones which I thought were you know relevant to the pandemic and as you can see there's a there's a trend isn't there it's all about uh, collaboration it's all about remote working it's all about tying and automating processes which work across um, organizations and it's I think all about you know allowing um, the safety of technology the safety of data and what I mean by that is you know, we can't have spreadsheets being emailed left, right and center. That kind of centralized uh, kind of data, you know, is fundamental. And, you know, there's a joke in, in uh, IT, a very poor joke, but, you know, what CTOs like me have been trying to achieve over 20 years, the pandemic sort of did in, in, in six months. And I think that's the first lesson for the pandemic as far as I'm concerned. The second lesson is we've been really, really lucky. I think mankind sort of lucked out. Because I think, you know, firstly, if you look at the uh, the remarkable work in creating a vaccine, creating several vaccines in a year, in a year, uh, it's just absolutely amazing. And but what we do know is five years ago that would have been impossible. And so it was lucky that the pandemic in a way happened when it when it did happen. But if you look at technology as well, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, we wouldn't be using Teams or Zoom or whatever to do our, our collaboration. We'll be using the phone system. And, you know, it would have been extremely difficult. We wouldn't have joined up um, uh, kind of hosted applications that we can all access via the web to do our work and communicate with each other. We'd all be instead trying to send spreadsheets to each other. And so it was kind of luck that um, the pandemic happened when it happened and technology was there to really take up the load and if you look at some of the, for example, cloud technologies, I mean, you know, it scaled to to do what was necessary. And I think, you know, it, it was amazing actually what has, was achieved during the pandemic. Um, and as an example, I would, I'm not going to really talk about our risk platform. If you want to hear about it, do you know talk to me I'd, I'd love to talk to anyone. But you know, we were, we are, and we were developing a platform to really. Uh, change the way insurance companies can manage their risks to be more proactive and more um, intelligent in the way that they price and select risk and the and more efficient in the way that they, that we administer it or that they, they can administer it um, and we chose and this is an example but we chose dynamics 365 as the basis for it and and we did that for a number of reasons the key reason uh, is the technology at the at the bottom in, in blue you know we've all got office 365 we know what how amazing that collaboration capability is compared to how it was in the past dynamics and the power platform provides you know real capability to develop applications and collaboration capabilities across organizations hosted safely uh, securely and with data backups etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's all underpinned by remarkable analytics tools, AI, et cetera, et cetera. All capabilities, really quite cheap, very available, and just ready to be used. And, and what we did was we built kind of what I call Lego bricks on top of that, you know, to represent, you know, claims, a policy, work items, 
etc cetera, etc cetera. and we use those lego, lego bricks to produce really powerful applications and products for us and for our, for our clients but the underpinning of it is that technologies was just wasn't there you know five years ago really as an example you know low code so if you're my age you'll remember visual basic which was amazing when it came to you know, citizen developers or for end user computing but it was chaotic in terms of the way data was stored and, and secured dynamics and the power apps provide a way of doing that same vb sort of power but centralized data and centralized governance so that is again something for us really important i think something for the industry has become important going forward and then the final slide and the final thing i wanted to say today and thank you for listening is you know around smartphones and around tablets and ipads and android and all that you know we've all got that technology now we're investing and this is an example we're investing in developing a surveyor app actually we're already working with a number of marine surveyors to get it right for them and for us design is really important it isn't just the kids who should get good apps you know i think everyone in business should have good apps as well and so we're working really closely with marine surveyors to understand their needs to make sure for example the complexity of these survey forms you can easily find your way around them and answer questions as you as you find facts in a way as opposed to going through it like a checklist and we'll do other things to make sure surveyors are doing their job right in terms of not just going click 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 down a list etc etc but the point is this is made possible by the technology which is available you know cheaply available today um, another example which people i'm sure will talk about today is the you know, crew health and whether apps can help in terms of crew health and mental health etc etc so that's all i wanted to say joss i'm going to hand back to you but maybe it'll go back to olga and hopefully to nick's video so thank you that's so much for listening adrian thanks so much for that presentation and i thought your your joke actually was particularly apposite and i think you know something that i'm sure nick will concur with when we get into the q a uh, but I can see that uh, I think it was actually Olga's internet connection, which was failing, but everything looks good now. So touch wood, we will now hear from, from Nick. So uh, Olga, I'll pass over to you. So thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Nick Roscoe. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Consurus, but I haven't always been a data wizard. My background's in insurance. I worked first at a PNI club. Then I was uh, Chief Operating Officer of Marine and Energy at a large brokerage, uh, where latterly I was the sales leader for the global specialties. Turning to Consirus, in some ways, I think we began as a solution looking for a problem. We could see the commercial value of IoT, which was the ability to monitor movement. And also we could see the power of the cloud, which was the ability to process and draw insights from massive volumes of data. We were founded in 2011, at which time our focus was on monitoring uptime. An early project involved the monitoring of critical security equipment at Heathrow Airport, but we also put SIMs into cars and vending machines to monitor their performance. By 2016, we realized there was a significant opportunity within marine insurance. There was a huge amount of data available in marine and no one was doing a lot with it, but more importantly, it was a line of business that hadn't been profitable for quite some time. So there was plenty of room for us to make a difference. So we turned to data science. Our data scientists use machine learning algorithms to analyze vast quantities of information at speed. And their job is to establish correlations between decisions or actions taken and their likely consequences. Suddenly, causes of risk that were previously unknown began to become part of the decision-making pro process. But you have to be able to access and interpret the data, and this isn't always easy. We realized that we could give underwriters insights on expected losses based upon billions, if not trillions of data points. As ships change their operational profile or trading pattern, underwriters would immediately know how that changed the risk. All sorts of new factors became part of pricing, such as whether a vessel traded more at night or in the day, whether she had greater exposure to extreme weather conditions, whether she's on liner service or tramping, where geographically she operates, 
and whether she's been repositioned. So through adding behavioral insights to known losses, we've become able to predict better than ever before what level of loss any vessel can expect in the year ahead. So this we've taken to market and we now have more than 20 marine customers who've embedded our platform Quest at the heart of their business. This shows you the Quest dashboard. COVID-19 threw up another and unexpected value in Quest. We were able to help underwriters witness changes in shipping patterns that impacted the risks they were insuring. The reductions in mileage as trade slowed, the changes in shipping routes as bunker prices dropped, and the buildup of vessels, especially cruise ships, all impacted their insured book. So I'm going to show you here the, the impact that this has on a risk. So this shows you um, the voyage from Singapore to, to Gibraltar across, across the, the, the lower axis, you can see the number of days taken, and across the vertical axis, you can see average wave heights. So here we are, vessel 15 day voyage and an average wave heights going up to uh, two meters. So if you then look at the, the impact of doing the detour around the Cape, suddenly it starts the same, the risk is the same, but quite quickly you find that, that the vessels are encountering uh, quite a lot higher waves and are also of course the, the, the voyage um, changes uh, from a 15 day uh, voyage to, to 25. So more recently we were asked for, for further insights on the aggregations of vessels around the Suez Canal as a result of the ever given. So here I'm going to show you what this looked like a week after the grounding with a snapshot of the accumulated exposure. The starting point is there were 446 vessels, their dead weight capacity was uh, 29 million uh, tons, and the uh, estimated sum insured that was held up was 12.4 billion. So an individual underwriter um, wants to know what this means for them. So what they can do is they can draw a polygon around the area of interest and see the impact on the vessels that they insure, which may in time be exposure. So in this case, on the right hand, you can see a polygon has been drawn in in pink that shows the zone of interest and what the consequence of that would be for a, a particular underwriter appears on the left in this case we're showing you what had happened to the global fleet but an individual under under uh, writer can look at their own accumulated exposure accumulations are also a common interest whether it's about port delays in this example or also about cargo particularly if a hurricane or storm uh, is coming in so with access to an ever increasing volume of high quality data, everyone benefits. Underwriters can use it to better price risk. They want to have the deeper levels of insight that will give them an edge on the competition. Operators will get new risk management insights. Brokers can use it to better present a risk and to give their clients risk management insights. So as the market adopts a data driven approach to pricing risk, ship owners can expect to see prices that will better reflect the actual level of risk associated with their vessels. And I think that we'll, we will see new, more flexible insurance products and policies emerge. For example, a number of people envisage a new product that will rate based upon the commercial decisions that an operator makes. Why should you pay the same rate going through sewers as you do going around the Cape. So essentially our vision is to facilitate a connected market where technology removes the barriers between us, deepens our understanding of risk and empowers the entire insurance community to solve critical issues. So thank you very much. That's great. And Nick, thank you very much for that presentation. And if I could ask uh, Nick, Adrian, James, uh, Jun and Ole to join the join the screen, that would be great. Uh, and we will we will start with the Q&A. So uh, we'll wait for everyone to share their screens, etc. And then we'll get cracking.
James and James and Ollie, you must be in the you must be in the office uh, wearing ties. <laughs> I just thought I'd actually get dressed up for the change for a change. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to get dressed up, yeah. Good, good. Well, welcome to you all. Uh, it's lovely to have you all for this for this Q and A, uh, and we'll we'll get right into it, I suppose. Uh, and I think I think to start off with one of the one of the primary questions that has uh, come up in my mind, I suppose, throughout this pandemic is the fact that you know. Uh, the marine insurance market in particular, but I'm sure this is true for all uh, all high ticket insurance markets, uh, is one based on relationships uh, where brokers and underwriters know each other uh, exceptionally well and there's a level of trust in the market. Uh, and I suppose my, my initial question is, has that been affected in any way uh, over the past 14, 15 months? And uh, James, as you're probably in London today, uh, I'll start with you on that one. Uh, I think, first of all, I think it's worth just just reiterating, we have proven that we can actually work remotely, the market hasn't collapsed. Um, but I think without doubt, the relationship and how underwriters and brokers and therefore with the clients has materially changed. Uh, I think underwriters to a degree can hide behind their screens. Uh, there was some, seen some evidence, I think in uh, March, but that's the numbers I think in Q2 last year, where they, within the middle of their hardening market that was happening anyway, that they thought about 5% was of the rate rise was hidden by underwriters basically, shall we say, being less susceptible to the broker's charms to keep prices down. Now, clearly at the time, probably, I think collectively the marine market probably breathed a sigh of relief because I think, uh, we all, the whole market was suffering but between 2015 through to 2019. Um, so I question whether that's good in the long term. What is certainly true is that brokers have less tools available to them. Um, the And I also question whether this is really good for the clients at the end of the day. And remember, we ultimately hear this for the clients. The virtual world and digitization enables contract formation to be happen quicker more efficiently that's good but actually negotiation does not mean that i think vanilla business makes uh probably doesn't get affected we see it come in it's probably about 80 percent of most people's portfolios but new risks or complex risks which actually drive the future of portfolios uh drives really the uh the overall performance of portfolios i think that's much much harder to do um, I think there's a lot less understanding. I think there's also, I, I suspect we'll kind of come and talk to the future. There's also a question, does in the virtual world, how does everybody learn? Because there is this ecosystem in London, and particularly in London, I know um, we've got two representatives from the Nordic markets here. We talk a lot, we see people, there's understanding gets driven. And it's, I, I, I wonder whether there's a dissipation of understanding, a drive to vanilla, and that I think has longer term implications. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I think almost what you're pointing at is a, a two tiered market where that risk that everybody understands can probably continue to be written remotely uh, and has done been done so successfully during the pandemic. And then where is that where that new risk comes about, which ultimately drives the market and which we're going to be seeing a lot of in the next 10 to 15 years that that human interaction is absolutely imperative i suppose um Ole, from a from a norwegian hull perspective do you do you have a view uh, on that question? yeah absolutely thank you uh so uh, from the norwegian hull club it's it's uh, the the covid 19 it's um it, it's different how it how it has been experienced and, and, and the experiences we have from it if we if we look at how underwriting is done from uh, from 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 Norway, it's 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 mainly done uh, without uh, being in a in a physical place like like the Lloyd's or the London market in any case. So so that shift wasn't that big. But if we look to the London office, yes, there has been a, a huge change. Uh, what is the, the, the biggest difference is is probably when you do not have a relationship, as as James mentioned. If if you had a relationship well with the, with a broker, for instance. And, and the, the risks were pretty known. Uh, it was it was 
it's been rather you know continued straightforward as well to 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 do it uh, to do it uh, uh, during the COVID nineteen and then do it on Teams or other videos uh, systems. But if you do did not have a relationship or there were more complex risks and there are new risks and new sales that you would like to to do, then definitely uh, it has been uh, much more it has been challenge more challenging. Uh, so I think what I've, what this has learned us as well. Uh, both the placing platform is PPL or white space, and doing things remotely or being physically, it, it has to, it, it will continue to be, uh, and I think we will see that when we get out of, totally out of the COVID-19, that they will live in parallel. Uh, you will, we will have both. Uh, you will have the straightforward risks, the easy things, you have relationships, uh, uh, that that will definitely benefit from, from uh, more digital platforms, more straightforward procedures, but when you have more complex risks, new clients, new risks, uh, then you definitely maybe you, you need you know this isn't done just through a meeting. It's it, it it's it's building up trust. It's getting to know one another just as it is because it's it's not just a commodity we're insuring. So I think we will see uh, things going in parallel. But COVID has definitely learned us uh, that we can also challenge the traditional way of, of doing underwriting in the London market. And Jen, I mean, from a from a guard perspective, obviously you you sort of span across insurance classes, uh, in and in your role in terms of attracting new business, uh, have you found have you found that more difficult in this virtual landscape? Uh, and will you soon be, uh, you know, returning to the office uh, and engaging with people face to face? I think my experience is uh, mixed during the pandemic. Um, I have sort of inquiry from broker I never met before and they're also starting a new job in their in their new company um I think what what we did in terms of sort of articulating the problem or, or delivering the solution it, it's much harder than before we have to make it much clearer through emails or uh, illustration samples and what have you um but in the same time I think the the, the relationship building with broker continues um I think we <laughs> Over the year, we, we all we all get used to sort of like moaning about uh, homeschooling, for example. Um, sort of uh, uh, technology didn't quite work. Um, but what I miss the most for the face to face is, is uh, an online interaction is, is very targeted. It's very sort of uh, you have a set time limit. You sort of you go in, do your things, and you come mm -hmm. out. Whereas the traditional face to face you get your normal things done and then you hear new things you have the small talks you pick up more it helps the business development as james sort of talks about um, that's what we miss the most but in the same time in terms of teaching the the younger generation of insurance prof professionals we have sort of broker meetings i expect it to be a one-to-one -one broker meeting and then sort of nine of them turn up and uh, eight of them are are, are junior employees and i, I think that must be good for them because mm. previously in my 20s i don't think i will get the chance to be in important meeting with clients uh, that early on so um we, we, as an industry we're finding a way to sort of adopt to to the challenge we have and i think as a whole we did quite well and that feeds that feeds quite nicely into a question that we've had from the floor from uh, neil jones Bar. Uh, regarding when uh, Lloyd's underwriters and marine insurance will be back in business in the city, uh, so to speak. Uh, and of course, well, James, as you are evidence, uh, there are insurers back in the city. Um, I've been up there uh, a couple of times uh, last week and I'm going up again tomorrow. There's certainly more business being done face to face, so to speak. Uh, and I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll push it out to the panel, but I'm assuming this will be a sort of iterative process, I suppose. And but slowly, people are are beginning to move back. Uh, James, what's your what's your view on that? Uh, well, I think officially Wednesday is uh, Marine Wednesday within Lloyd's, yep. where they've partitioned it. Um, so that's uh, clearly the main point. Uh, the city seems to be more populated um, later on in the week, and dare I say, it around lunch times, because people are seeing as an opportunity to reconnect and see people um, without doubt just speaking to the brokers around and other underwriters uh, there is a drive for people to come back I think partly people are a bit bored of working from home I think there's also I think there is 
the renewal percentages last year were up and new business numbers were down. And I think people are beginning to look at the longer term impact that would have on their book. Um, so they're wanting to make uh, that word, the word that we, uh, the younger generation that we know about FOMO, fear of missing out. People want to do virtual and they want to be in person. And I think that will be um, to the benefit, I think, of the, um, of the overall insurance market ecosystem, actually. Mm. I think uh, picking up on, on something that uh, Ole said and, and to be directed at, you know, Adrian and Nick, really. Um, obviously, we were forced into quite a significant change as a market as a consequence of the pandemic. Uh, and people were forced to utilise technologies and platforms uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, how much how much do you feel that that change is a sticking plaster to make do whilst we are, you know, moving what well, during the pandemic and as we move out? Uh, and how much of it do you think is is going to be the, the here to stay, uh, I suppose, and in, in for the long term? And Nick, I'll, I'll start with you on that one. Yeah, I think the, the, the change, the, um, the need to adapt um, has broken down unfounded resistance. So I think there were those people who just didn't like change for the, for the sake of it. Um, and uh, they've had to try something new. And, and I think that that's happened. Um, but I suppose that from where we are, what is most noticeable is uh, the change of attitude and the change of thinking. And I think the, the thing that sort of surprised me most is, is, that, is that we're seeing uh, insurance companies now coming out of this. And it looks like they've been spending an awful lot of time thinking and they're coming out with new agendas and, and new plans. So I'm seeing the beginning of an inflection point um, where everyone is. We've got more customers in contract now than we've ever had. We're seeing a real pickup, and we're also seeing um, that there is a lot more certainty in terms of the agenda that, that, that insurers are, are, are trying to, to drive. So it's an exciting uh, it, Going back to your thing, sticking plaster or not, well, we're, we're not part of the, the, the quote and buy transaction, which is where I think a, a, that, that might be a more relevant question. But in terms of data, it, 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 it's been an ongoing journey, but it, it's getting faster. Adrian, do you have a do you have a view on that? Yeah, I think it's funny, really, because I probably agree with the rest of the panel. You know, I see it. With, there's two types of activities, and I think that has become clear. There's what I call kind of business as usual, transactional things. Yeah, we need to generate this document. We need to do you know execute this function at this time. We need to have a quick chat about X, Y, Z. You know, why would you bother having a, 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 a kind of meeting in the diary and have to travel somewhere just to do something mundane? On the other hand, where, where time is really valuable, where you need to kind of whiteboard, you know, in terms of IT terms, you know, whiteboard a hard idea, have a, a difficult discussion, uh, you know, about an issue, uh, have a negotiation. That's when you need to get face to face. And I think what people will do is, use the technology to clear the diaries to make space for the important conversations, or at least that's what people should do, I think. Absolutely right. And I think, um, you know, one of the one of the areas that is, you know, potentially of interest, and we've, we've looked a lot at the underwriting side of things. Nick, you, you, you produced a really interesting illustration in your presentation in regards to the Ever Given and working out, uh, you know, potential exposures uh, as a consequence of that, which is surely wouldn't have been possible uh, two, three years ago, whether it whether it be for the pandemic or not. Uh, and that was a clear illustration, if you like, of the utility of the Internet of things. But from a practical basis, uh, you know, moving about surveyors, uh, getting correspondence on the scenes, et cetera, in, in the cases of casualties, how has how has that been affected over the last, uh, you know, over the last 12 months? Uh, Jen, I'll, I'll start with you on that one. Sure. Um, uh, I think for the for the sort of mundane cases, we, we, we don't see there's a restriction for local surveyors per se. So they, they're not sort of subject to the same travel restrictions. Obviously, for more complex cases where we traditionally have to sort of send a surveyor from more the expert hubs, uh, that's been affected. But then technology develops, so sort of remote surveying or, or telephone or, or teleconference interview conducted by lawyers seems to be quite effective. Um, 
we we sort of adopt as as sort of we see the situation develop and i think my colleagues here will probably share the same that this is kind of adopted by the industry and it's probably going to stay for the future do you have a do you have a sort of a similar view there surveyors, uh, get, get ships to be docked, uh, get repairs carried out. So definitely we invested a lot uh, through the last year in, in the issue of remote survey technology. Uh, we linked up with, uh, with a company called LibreStream uh, to, do, uh, to do remote surveys. Um, and also uh, uh, really had a push on, on a lot of the di digital initiatives that we have when it comes to a collaboration uh, with everyone involved in, in the casualty, especially the surveyors, and developing portals for, for, for collaborating be between a surveyor and, uh, and the claim sampler, the in-house claim sampler. Um, and that has definitely proven uh, to be very efficient. Uh, and and this is, these are tools that, that definitely uh, are as relevant post-COVID-19 as they were during the COVID-19. Just think about it. Could be security issues uh, later on that that prevents you from 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 doing a uh, a survey or having people traveling in, uh, and and even if you can travel, uh, you don't maybe you don't have to do all the travels uh, to do follow up surveys and and etc. So so this has definitely been a uh, a good push in in a direction, and and also as June said, uh, actually the it it ended up not being that high risk as we thought because it was easier to get surveyors uh, on scene. Uh, so, um, but then again, uh, we're, we're, we're paid to think worst case scenarios, aren't we? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And again, you know, I think perhaps it wasn't uh, an obvious thought at the beginning, but those efficiencies in terms of casualty response are another way in which this market is going to change uh, for the long term, uh, I suppose. Uh, and I, I can certainly see a future where surveyors uh, and you know lawyers, etc., will not be flying around the world uh, as much as they were attending attending casualties and complicated situations uh, as they were sort of pre twenty twenty. Uh, and that sort of this all this all leads me on to a, a relatively fundamental question, uh, I suppose. Uh, I think we all I think we all understand the need for face-to-face uh, -face interaction when it comes to complex risk, etc. But certainly, uh, the London cluster uh, is a, is a genuine marketplace, whether that be in the company market or or within Lloyd's. Um, and you know, uh, traditionally, obviously, a broker would spend their mornings in in that marketplace. Is there is there still a need? for the market to operate uh, in that manner uh, in the future. Uh, and James, I suppose you're a, you're a sensible man to, to start <laughs> off with that with that question. Not often I'm called sensible on that question. Um, <laughs> I, um, I generally think there is, uh, primarily because insurance is, a, is an ecosystem that works. It, it's been around for ages. I think it's worth remembering that insurance is a highly commoditized business already um the two predominant wordings in globally are in how for example is the institute time clauses and the nordic plan that actually provides an opportunity for differentiation um people kind of know what they have the the lloyd's market has every time it's gone down the approach of big limits uh, big line size, uh, uh, significant percentage shares. The results have always got worse. And I think there's just a, a game which is very valid in insurance that uh, subscription markets make sense. Now, whilst Lloyd's share of international marine insurance has been gradually reducing over time, it still probably is the single most coherent piece of of common pricing, which lots of these um, are called secondary markets around the world benefit from. And if that gets broken, I think you'll end up with um, certainly 
I would argue what you saw in 2015 through to 2019 with too many competitors, too many people trying to be leaders, pricing going down to the bottom. I think there is a need, um, and this isn't about um, collusion or anything. This is actually about the product has proper value. It needs to be charged at proper price. We also have to recommend that rec recognize that the underlying costs of the business are going up. The regulators are driving up costs. When I started insurance, actuaries were a, a little little known word, problem, most commonly associated with life insurance. Now they are correctly part of the world, um, proven data science and all of those other efficiencies. But they also come at a cost. We've also got risk departments. We've got all sorts of other things. The you get an expertise that a a physical marketplace, and I, I do agree that London is a marketplace, not just Lloyd's, that the rest of the world actually benefits from. It doesn't mean that everybody has to be participant for it, and I think there is lots of creativity about it. I think we've got to be careful about having too many, I'll call it generic MGAs, which is just recycling of capacity. Um, I think if an MGA, you need to exist for a clear purpose then that that is that is recognized um it's also worth recognizing remembering that with the amount of extra capital in the market it we're very much viewed as uh, behind the scenes way though the some two models work that capital is provided and people assign a contract to it the romantic issue or uh, the, romantic, the romantic view of lloyd oh there's a relationship back there is not the reality behind the scenes in insurance companies so there is a need for a physical marketplace, but that physical marketplace does need to be able to operate virtually and in a digitized way. And the physical marketplace needs to recognize that digitization can help with the, the processing costs, make it much more contract certain, much quicker, which is better for everybody. People who are employed in the market and then focus on what they should be focused on, which is the value add. The, which is where people can actually look at the complex risks, understand their portfolios better, and, and therefore provide a service, which we ultimately have to do, which meets the new challenges. James, that was a, a really interesting response, and you've, you've raised a number of other issues, which I'll pick up later in the Q&A. But Nick, you know, you were, you were a uh, well, in a PNI club first, and then a then a broker for the majority of your career, uh, and you've now, of course, turned into an insure tech provider. Is your view similar to to James's in regards to the the physical marketplace, if you like? Um, I think there is uh, definitely a need for a physical marketplace. Um, I don't think it's going to be the marketplace of 2019. I think there is a significant transformation and, and, and change. Uh, that has been very positive. I, I, I would have liked to have heard a little bit more from James about uh, behaviour and about the uh, the science of underwriting, maybe more than the experience of underwriting. Um, I think I, th I think we are going through a, a, a seismic change in that respect, and I, I, I think that, that that it's not just going to be the way in which we transact. I think it's going to be the way in which we look at risks. It's going to it's going to change. So James, please come in. Oh, sorry, um, you're absolutely right about the science, the science of underwriting. Um, data is, the use of big data is very much in its infancy. I think we should also remember that data has always been in the market. It's just been stuck in underwriters' heads and the very good underwriters have very long and very deep memories and are surprisingly good at complex calculations there and then. Um, I think everybody's welcoming the the advantage the enhancements that products like Consirus as it currently stands looks i i know a bit about Consirus, but not but not a lot but i'm pretty guessing that this is only kind of like a stage base camp and there are about five or five or more stages material developments that are probably mapped in the pipeline if i look at the science of underwriting from a kind of an underwriting management perspective we have business plans which are all narratives we have risk appetites which are all uh, narratives. We have pricing tools, which are all data. And wherever I've been in, uh, and I worked in two, uh, three Lloyd's managing agencies in predominantly marine syndicates, there is very little data that actually joins what the underwriters talk and say they do that evidences to what then appears in the pricing tools. So there is a huge need to evolve that. 
Now, we should also remember that um, there is whoever builds a pricing tool, whoever builds uh, an algorithm has confirmation bias built in somewhere from their understanding at the time. And therefore, uh, we need to be able to build in this constant assessment back to the reality. What have we seen? Um, data on past performance, if we go and look at data five, 10 years ago in the marine market, it's not going to be looking at the level of digitization that's involved in the, in a, in a, in the new range of engines with the control panels. Um, it, therefore, there always has to be the ability to make sure you've got the insight, which is not data driven, but people's understanding of what the implications of things should be. So underwriting is a science, but it's also probably more, it's also, um, I'm going back to my common roots, but it's a social science. It's not, it's part art, it's part, it's, it's part science. Um, I know of numerous risks where on paper, the, the risks look exactly the same, they do the same things, but there's one risk you want to write, the other one you don't, and you can't always identify it from the data that the brokers provide you. So you have to go and find other information for it. And that's where I think underwriters and insurers are just on the, the journey. And that's what organisations like Consurus can help deliver. Yeah, I think we, you know, it's the starting point. I've got, I've got to come back on that. You know, we, we have over 20 marine clients and they're uh, working extensively with data. They uh, are of a view that, that a vessel doesn't keep doing the same thing time and time again, that patterns change, that behaviour changes. They might be doing more at night. They may have gone from uh, liner to tramping. They, they, they may have been repositioned. And if you look at the, the volume of data, we're, we're working with 3 billion data points. And that has to be analyzed. And that has a relevance. And the underwriter has to look at that. And they have to open their mind to the opportunities rather than falling back on the experience and uh, what's been learned. And, you know, a lot of the rating is done based upon loss record and someone could just have, have had bad luck mm -hmm. they might have changed their their their, their, their technical managers or, or 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 whatever and the underwriter has got to be able to to transact on that basis so i think there is uh, to me from what i'm seeing and i've been you know i've been in in, in the market that, 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 that you guys are in i've been and i i've been in broking I'm seeing the whole thing turning absolutely on its head now because people realize there is so much more out there. I, I think probably if you look at if you, the starting point is, is you, you get companies that start saying, we've got quite a lot of data and you say, okay, give us that data. And it's like, oh no, it's valuable, but they don't know how it's valuable. And I think then they start working with the data a bit more and they, they begin to understand how they can, how they can get value out of it. And then they, how they can make decisions on it and how they can improve, improve their book on it and how they can get the edge on the competition. If I could just give you one example from that, and a, a friend of mine in the market is Phil Graham, who said that um, it was the difference between, I sat with him and we had two cups of coffee, we were both drinking a, a cappuccino, and I said, why is it that you're looking at data in the way you are? And he said, well, to, to you and me, Nick, there are two cups of coffee here. I want to be the underwriter who knows which one's got oat milk in it. And then, then he dropped, and that is the difference between using data and, and going on experience. I think Phil being uh, the chair of the Facts and Figures Committee, he have to live with his reputation. So <laughs> he's very <laughs> data-driven. Um, yeah, sort of go, going back to Joss's sort of comment on whether whether the, the market will exist, it will, it will evolve, I think. Um, the brokers are not standing still. There's a lot of investment and development going to the, the broker side of technology. Um, the broker does a huge amount of uh, contribution, value add to the clients in terms of benchmarking, contract certainty. I mean, the transaction is smooth to the point that when it being executed, because there's a lot of groundwork being done between brokers and underwriters to, to suss out the exact capacity can be sustained at a certain pricing level. I mean, until we get to a point that it's a sort of close-ended sort of auction bit technology exists in some of the insurance link um, securities, we're still going to see this sort of transaction patterns happen. What we will get better is there will be more audit trail provided by the digital platform. There'll be more tools provided 
by the likes of considerers. Um, and we just need to be smarter underwriters and smarter brokers to provide better client service. Oli, oh, Adrian, sorry, come in. Yeah, I'm happy to comment on this as well. Uh, that's on how about that? I, just, I mean, I think Adrian, you go first, then we'll go. We'll go over to. We'll go over to Oli. Uh, I didn't mean to talk. No, about you. Um, I just want to. I mean, I think uh, Nick is obviously correct in terms of the need for data to drive decisions. Uh, I think no one in no one with technology background would argue with that. And I've worked in insurance outside of marine for a long for a long while, and um, you know, there's many insurance companies who don't analyze their claims files. So you know, that people will improve. But it's for me, however, there's something. You know, it's like tracker funds. Uh, who, which have basically said, we, we'll just you know track the market. We don't do any research, and we transact very, very cheaply. And I think there's one area that we know that we can take costs out of the market, and that's the administration side of things. So you can price right. You need to price risks right for sure, but you also need to transact really, really efficiently. And I think for good or for ill, a lot you know we don't have many shouting exchanges yeah. anymore. And I think for good or for ill. The, you know the market will change and will become more automated uh, except for what they you know specialized uh, specialized uh, risks and insurance obviously. Um, but I think that's that's the way the, the world is moving um, and and um, you know I think we can't really stop we can't really stop it Ollie, over to you sorry yeah um, uh, marketplace, the need for that or not. I'm thinking then about London. Uh, I think it is a bit like like uh, Adrian mentioned uh, earlier this session that uh, that uh, we will live with with the systems in parallel. We will have uh, new digital tools that will take away the more, more the day to day easy uh, business, so we can spend more time on the more difficult things. And that we definitely need to have a physical meeting point. If that needs to be a Lloyd setup, or or just that we are in the same area, uh, I I didn't comment too much uh, on that. Uh, but I do think there is an, uh, also in the future uh, a need for for a physical marketplace, and, and that we will see these living uh, close together. Um, and and following up on Nick, I mean data driven underwriting uh, for us at Norwegian Health Club that that is a, is, is a no brainer. I, I mean we've been using data analytics for, for, for decades. It's, it's just improving, improving, adding more data, analyzing more. Uh, but that goes for, for, for where you can do data-driven uh, analytics. If you look at, at more uh, special risks or, 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 or other specific issues, then, then, uh, then data-driven underwriting is more complicated and you need other competence uh, to understand the risk and to write the, the, the right contracts. But definitely, where you can do data driven, where there is where there is a certain where there is an amount of, of data, enriching the data you have, and analyzing it, and finding out what what what, what you call an, an an objective price on a risk should be, and then it is of course for the underwriter to how does how does that fit with the market? Uh, are we way off? Are we way below? And then and then of course the underwriter's job is to adjust and to know when to walk away uh, from a risk. I think that is maybe as important as to when to sign a risk. Mm. So, so definitely data driven is, is extremely uh, important going forward. And I think very much agree with, with Nick. I think we, what we will see going forward is that the companies that are able to adapt to data driven underwriting and to further explore this, that's they will survive. They will they will be able to 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 maneuver and and to understand how to how to actually do uh, manage good underwriting uh, to the benefit of the, of the client. And then I'm talking about the ship owner or the, or the ship manager. And those that do not uh, understand data-driven underwriting, they will, they will, uh, they will unfortunately have, have, have losses that much that they will probably uh, throw in the towel and, and, and leave marine underwriting. Because marine underwriting is, yeah, it is challenging. It is a niche. Uh, and it's uh, and it's uh, it's it's not the mainstream underwriting. I couldn't agree more. Uh, absolutely, and there is so much data out there. You've got to work out how to how, how to work with the data, which of course brings in the in the in the AI and 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 how to get how to how to make decisions based upon it. But 
if you're only going with the old data set, you're only using half of the information available. And the, we are seeing a, cl a clear division within the market that it does feel as if it's going in two directions. And the ones that are adopting data are going quicker and quicker. And therefore, the divide is becoming more and more apparent. I'd just like to just we've, we're already over time, but um, I hopefully everyone's got a little bit longer. I just want to I sort of pick up a point that, that James made. And that's that's the question, I suppose, in a way, uh, the physical market provides uh, a check and a balance to new entrants coming in and, and driving down cost and potentially compromising uh, on quality. Is is that a, is that a risk that the other panelists can see moving forward, or or is it really the fact that it will be the established underwriters in the market who are able to understand uh, the new data coming in and therefore assure quality and therefore business as a consequence of that I'm, I'm just interested to explore that a bit further and uh, you know Jen maybe we'll, we'll start with you on that one um I think I think there's always going to be new winners so smart guys comes in have a different perspective to it but I'll take it quite a philosophical view to to this if, if you look at the survival buyers in, in the market who are the strongest players they are the longer established players they have the need internally to sort of compete with the newcomers. They have to invest. They have to sort of use the data they have in place to uh, to to make the most out of it, really. Um, and, and you look at, I mean, analysis of the Lloyd's performance, which is the slightly more transparent ones you can you can see in the market. The ones with uh, with longer track record tend to have a, a more stable returns and, and and better returns over over time. But a lot of time is is their their sort of strategy being consistent. I think consistent, predictable is a is an important thing from clients' point of view, from brokers' point of view. James, firstly, did I did I sort of describe that concern correctly? Uh, I suppose. Uh, uh, and do you do you feel sort of reassured in any way by the fact that you know? ultimately that knowledge base is going to be needed to interpret the data that is coming in from the tech providers correctly uh, i mean clearly i mean it's fair to say there's they're good underwriters and bad underwriters and there are good underwriters in small new operations uh, let, let's let's we forget uh clive washborn has just turned up at a new operation but he was highly let's face it was highly successful for many years at, at beasley um the the need to understand and transpose that information is really important. Um, we and the reality is, if you're in a risk managed business like insurance, the people that the top are going to go to are the, the heads of department, which are the people who, by and large, have been there for 20, 30 years, uh, or in the industry for well, probably that long. Therefore, that is going going to happen. There is a question about, um, I think that's part of what, what Nick was alluding to, are they sufficiently uh, Luddite that they don't want to embrace the, the new future? Um, now, I'm pretty certain the desire to digitize the back office of most operations means that underwriters who largely ignore it will get into, into trouble. There have been... Uh, there, there are. Tech, I mean, obviously, there's uh, well known that you got Kai that's been set up. If I pronounce that correctly, as Brit. I know a couple of other follow market operations are, are being set up. I think there is going to be a case of how you can get this data driven underwriting, but I still think we're not at the point where the data gives you the answer. You still need somebody who knows enough to say yes or no, yeah. and the the world. I think anybody who's seen the, the UK government go, let's just trust the algorithm. No, it can then travel and you, and then it takes a. It's very hard to piece everything back together very quickly because of reputation. So, the need to, I, one should be very careful about just jumping into this newfangled thing. Isn't it great? Isn't it marvelous? Without looking at the ramifications of turning off from the past. I think, as Jun correctly said. 
underwriters have written very stable books for a long time. They understand it. They're kind of evolving naturally w with the underlying business. Now, mm. I don't know many un hull underwriters who actually understand exactly how a ship is put together because they rely on actually P&I clubs. They rely on port state controls. They rely on uh, the classification societies doing all the right things to keep things up, up to date. But ultimately, there is a strategy. We know some people like to write blue water. Some people like to write brown water. And there is a there are markets within markets, and that's part of the game. If everybody wrote everything, it would become one would be become a very dull, boring place. But actually, the clients would have nowhere to go, which ironically would mean somebody says, "Oh, there's an opportunity. I'll go there. I can do that better." Yeah. So, I think a digitization, virtualization has massively showed what we can do. Uh, I agree that 2019 won't happen again, but remember, most people were trying to get rid of 2019 because it was, a, it was the soft, end of the really soft market. They want a new place. Mm. And that's the other bit, which I think one, we sh we're going to come out of this in a harder market, but we don't necessarily know how it got hard. Was it because of the virtualness, the pandemic bit, or was it uh, because of a lot of renewals? I think there's going to be a whole great big shakeup. Yeah, yeah. Does does anybody else have anything else to to add on on that point? No, I I, I, I totally agree with you. The the underwriter will will remain forever valid, and the experience is incredibly important and and absolutely not to be uh, uh, belittled in any way. Uh, but it's there is more information, and so the underwriter I think becomes you know they 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 will have a, increasing powers and, and increasing insights. And I think that will be a more exciting market. And Adrian, I saw you wanted to come in. Yeah, first. just I mean, just to add again, Nick, we are as one really. But I think the data is one thing, and I think it's the algorithm. You know, I think uh, yeah. the big uh, underwriters, the big brokers, will develop their own algorithms, their own digital models, and that will be based on the experience of the underwriters and the human beings. So I think the data is yeah is there, it's kind of like a utility at one level. And then it's the expertise that generates the model, which will differentiate the different uh, underwriters. And that's all. I know I've got my hands up. Uh, I've done a, I've done a terrible job of moderating because we only have three minutes <laughs> to wrap this up. But uh, Ole, I'll I'll pass over to you, uh, and then and then James. I see you want to come back in. One of the challenges with, with also with, with with analyzing data is that is that uh, if, if we look at Aldos, uh, which we which we have. Uh, 2% of, of, of the claims make out uh, over, or close to 50% of, of the claims cost. So it is, uh, so you don't get it, you, get, you don't get a frequency in analyzing 2% of the claims because there will be one offs. They are they yeah. have a gigantic one that costs so enormous. It's, it's an enormous fire that, that you know, just ruins your, ruins your year. Uh, and, it is, and that's some of the challenges when it comes to uh, marine underwriting. Uh, the last thing I would just like to point out is that Instech, we talk a lot about Instech, we, we often forget the the, uh, the, the the transaction bit. And I think that is probably one of the greatest challenges, having all the uh, the complexity of how hull underwriting is, is still done globally with, 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 with different shares, different uh, balance, different bonuses, different, 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 uh, many ways. Uh, and and, and how all these transactions can flow with, with totally lack of standards uh, and, and uh, that is one of the which we see one of the greatest challenges how can we how can we smoothen the process much much more uh, so we can start getting down transaction costs and, and smoothen up the business because a lot of the instech companies that come in also in london they they're Probably they're not starting with marine because marine is, and it's definitely not with Hull, because it's such a small business. They will start with other businesses, and and uh, so it's kind of so. What do we do that are in marine? Um, do we start talking and, and to see how we can change this business? That was part of the topic when we had this marine insurance Nordics uh, on on a theme where we, we discussed about this. And I think that is something that um, at least is close to my heart. It's it's, it's not that cool for, as a, as data analytics and analyzing risks, but it's definitely somewhat not something that could, could drive this uh, industry uh, forward. Ollie, you've done a you've done a great job of segueing into uh, what I'm sure will be another webinar at another time. So thank <laughs> you for doing my job for me there. Uh, it's much appreciated. 
you know, I think we can take some some pretty clear takeaways from this. Uh, will there still be a need for a physical market? Absolutely. Uh, is risk is going to become more complex, which will require people to engage more proactively? Yes. Uh, but they will unable they will be unable to write that risk effectively unless they start utilizing uh, the data that is available to them uh, in real terms. Uh, so on that point, uh, I would like to uh, thank all of our panelists for an excellent discussion that we haven't given long enough to. Uh, I think it's fair to say I'm sure we could have gone on much longer. Um, but thank everyone. Uh, for those who are interested in the football, I hope you enjoy your evening this evening. Uh, and and thanks again, uh, and we'll we'll be in touch very soon. So take care and bye bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you all. Bye.